Well, good morning, everyone. We're glad to be here this morning, glad for the uh, presence of each one, especially thankful for the visitors who are with us this morning. We're glad you're here. You may already have a clue as to what we might be talking about this morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak just a little bit about some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. How many of you like to receive an invitation? Most of us do. You know, most of the time when we receive an invitation, uh, it's something that's positive. It's a celebration. Uh, in contrast, uh, Sister Marge received a summons, uh, the jury duty. Uh, most invitations are not like that. Most invitations, uh, especially if it's a personal invitation, make you feel special. Uh, and... Uh, a couple weeks ago, most of you got some invitations probably in your mailbox. Um, there's going to be a celebration here in, a, in two weeks. There's going to be a wedding. And uh, you received an invitation to that, a personal invitation. And I'd like to draw our minds this morning to an invitation like no other invitation, an incomparable invitation. Uh, and it's the invitation that we sang about uh, so you can turn for a scripture this morning to Matthew chapter 11. And to get the context, I'd actually like to read the whole chapter. Uh, we find the invitation at the end of the chapter, uh, verses, verse uh, 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. No, I'm sorry, 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But let's begin reading it at the first verse of chapter 11. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But what shall I liken this, gener what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which he, most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the days of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who were exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom. Sodom in the days of judgment than for you. 
At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The conversation that, uh, where Jesus gives this invitation was brought on or brought about by some messengers that came from, from John the Baptist. And I guess for, for many years as I read this, I was uh, sort of thinking that it was John that was having the doubts. Um, when I did a little more studying on that, it seems especially the early church did not look at it that way. Um, if, if we turn uh, up to Luke, ahead just a little bit to Luke uh, chapter 7, verses 18 to 23. Luke 7, uh, verse 18. It says, then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. So previous to this, uh, it's, it says that great fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him, about Jesus, went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And then it goes on in the same uh, light as it did in, uh, in Matthew. And then in John, uh, John chapter 3, verses 23 to 35. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I, am, I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly, earthly and speaks of, of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true, for whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath, wrath of God abides in him. And the way the early church uh, had saw that and the way um, it seems may have happened here is there, there was a jealousy that broke out between uh, John's disciples uh, and, and the disciples of Jesus. Uh, we see there that they, they came and they said, well, what's this all about, uh, this Jesus and his disciples? And John said, well, you go ask Jesus, you, you go talk to Jesus and ask him. I ask him, are you the one? And so they came to Jesus with this question. And Jesus answered them uh, by saying, well, what, what have I been... Uh, what, what, what have you found? The lame walk, um, the blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So what I want to point out is we had a group of people here who were offended um, at, at Jesus. Uh, they may have been uh, full of doubts. Uh, 
John knew from, from the beginning that Jesus was the Christ. That even when he was in the womb, uh, he, he leaped uh, for joy when he heard about it. And as soon as his, uh, the, his disciples left, Jesus commends John, and he says that, what did you go out to see? You didn't go out to see a wind, a reed shaken in the wind that's just going to be tossed back and forth. Uh, and so I take from that that John himself was, uh, was, was remaining uh, confident. Uh, his disciples, however, had, had a lot of doubts. They were skeptical, uh, maybe a little jealous. So we have, that's the one group of people that, that he's, he's uh, talking about. Jesus, John's disciples were upset about the crowds following Jesus. Uh, and so uh, Jesus gave him that response. Uh, verse 12, he, sa- uh, he says that the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Um, Again, the early Christians sort of viewed that as, that's a little bit difficult language to, to understand, but they viewed it, basically the kingdom of God is not for, it's not for wimps. It's not for the, uh, for the people that are, that are easily shaken. Um, so there were people that, that had doubts. There were people that were offended because of him. Uh, there were people maybe who were afraid uh, or, or weak. And they were unsettled and restless. And then he says, uh, what, what am I going to liken this generation to? Um, and he said, they're, they're like a, a group of children playing in the, in the marketplace. And, and they say, let's, let's, let's go dancing. Let's play dancing. And uh, they didn't dance. Uh, d- don't want to do that. Well, okay, then let's play funeral. Uh, and, and they also didn't, didn't want to do that. Um, and Jesus said that's just like this generation is that John came and he didn't eat and drink Uh, he clothed himself in camel's hair he lived a very uh, uh, strict life in a way and they said well he has a demon and then son of man I came along and I eat and drink and they say look a glutton and a wine bibber and a, a friend of tax collectors and sinners um, again, we see a restlessness. We see uh, a fickleness uh, in, in the current generation. And then he speaks uh, here of, of people who were, who were unrepentant. Jesus said that the works that I did, if they were uh, done in, in Chorazin and Bethsaida, if they were done in Tyre and Sidon, the people would have already repented uh, in in sackcloth and ashes. And then he talks about Capernaum, which was his home base. It was the place where he worked out of, and he says that they also rejected him. And so Jesus is building up to this invitation. And he lets us know uh, that it's for all. It's not complicated. It's hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed to babes. And Jesus said in Matthew 18 uh, that unless we become as little children, uh, we can't see the kingdom of God. So we have these groups of people. We have people that were plagued by doubts. Uh, We had people that could not be pleased. They were restless. They were undecided. And there were those that would not repent. And so Jesus came... Uh, comes with this invitation. And I'd like to look at this invitation in the light of uh, the verbs that we see here. I'll just write them up here just so they're on our minds. Come. Take. Learn. And the last one is can be a a noun or a verb, rest. Come. The invitation is to come. Come unto me. Not come to a a way of thinking. Not come to necessarily a, a particular creed. But Jesus says, come 
to me. And this is not the only time we see this invitation. This invitation comes many times. Uh, it was prophesied about Jesus clear back in Isaiah where he says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. When Jesus called his disciples in Matthew 4, 19, he says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. John 7, 33, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Matthew 9, 14, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Revelation 3, 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And the uh, Bible of Scripture ends with Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let who, him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whosoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. And here he says, the invitation is, Come unto me. And, and who, who, who is he speaking to? All that labor and are heavy laden. And the idea here is it's sort of like a string on an instrument that is just stretched to the almost to the breaking point. Uh, and I think we've all made that the comment, especially recently here, that people around us seem to be just stretched really tight. Uh, you, you do the, just the wrong thing when you're on the road, and they're like a string that's just, just all but ready to, to snap. Our society is that way. This goes back uh, to our, our discussion in Matthew chapter 5, where it, it says to be poor in spirit. It's the idea of a ship that is laden to the point that water is almost coming over the gunnels. Or a beast that's overburdened. Now we find ourselves... At least I find that this invitation is a timeless invitation because it still rings true today in our, in our, in our situation. Uh, with all mankind's advances, it's still valid today and maybe more so than ever before. It's a timeless invitation. And who, who is this uh, invitation uh, geared toward? It's towards all. All who sin bear the burden of sin. So we're all guilty of that, and we all sense the, the burden that we're under. The Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so this invitation is open to all. It's open to the doubtful. It's open to the restless. And it's open to those who need repentance. It's open to those who see their need, uh, who recognize and feel weighed down and weary. And the promise is rest. So we answer, we come to Jesus and we answer the call to come. Then what? So we have the, the invitation, come. But there's this great paradox. So he's, he promises us rest and then he says, take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you. So here we have the word come we have the great invitation. He says, take my yoke upon you. That's our obligation. And we, we, we know about the, the yoke of oxen. And I'd like to picture it this way. I think we've all seen the yoke of oxen uh, where there's two oxen there together. And I'd like to picture it. There's Jesus standing there with the yoke and there's an empty spot. There's an empty spot beside him. And he's inviting us. He says, come, hitch up with me. You mean the way to rest, the way to freedom, is to put yourself in a yoke? And I'll tell you right now that the world around us thinks that's ridiculous. They think it's absolute nonsense and foolishness. And today we have a battle going on between Deuteronomy 6 and Disney. In 2013, 
there was a Disney film that came out that took the world by a storm. Um, the, the movie was called Frozen. And there was a song in that, uh, in that film called Let It Go. Incidentally, the LGBTQ plus community used this song as a sort of a coming out anthem. I'll just read what uh, the, some comments that, that people have written about this, this song. Let it go is an anthem of self-acceptance, the story of somebody learning to embrace the things that make them different. The universal power ballad resonated worldwide and across generations. Nearly a decade after its release, children everywhere still sing the stirring chorus melody before they speak their first words. It hit the top five, won an Academy Award for the Best Original Song of 2014, and has been translated into 44 languages. It's a global phenomenon. I'll read you that lyrics, uh, just a couple lyrics. Let it go, let it go, can't hold back anymore. Let it go, let it go, turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small and the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go, let it go. Contrast that to Deuteronomy 6. Verses 4 to 9. This is familiar to us. Deuteronomy 6. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." The evil one is very sly. He permeates the mind of our children with this anthem of rebellion. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. And I can't help but think, you know, we, we look and just see the state of affairs, especially with the LGBTQ and all that uh, things that we see. And... They, they were little girls singing that 13 years ago. And it said before they could even, before they could even talk, they were humming the, the, the melody to that. And it's, I think Brother John has mentioned here before the power of, of, of music and the power of, of this kind of thing. And those lyrics permeate people's mind. The way to freedom is to cast off restraint. It's, o it's only when... Only within parameters and within boundaries that life has meaning at all. When we were in Chile, uh, the boys would try to play baseball, but they didn't know the rules. Uh, they would see, they watched this game on TV, I guess, and, and it, it didn't make any sense to them. So they, they would play and make up their own rules or uh, try to play with, without rules. It was a disaster. It, no one really, I mean, they lost interest in it within a very short time because there were no rules. There were no parameters. It was meaningless. Jesus says, if you want real freedom, if you want rest, you yoke up with me. Surrender to my lordship. Step into that yoke. You know, that yoke keeps us close to Jesus. Jesus. When we're yoked up with him, we're never alone. It 
keeps us from straying. We're never lost. And the yoke is designed to share, to share the load. There's that famous Dutch painting of the lady with the yoke over her shoulders carrying the two water buckets. And the idea is that that, that helps share the, share the load. And what a privilege we have uh, to, to be able to yoke up with him. And the question was asked in Sunday school this morning, what holds us back? What holds us back from that? Why wouldn't we want to do that? He says, come, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Let me teach you. Let me guide you. And I think it's really important as we're uh, in our Sunday school, and I'd like uh, to keep this, us to keep this in mind as we study the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's vitally important. And I think probably one of the epiphanies that I had in my life is that the things that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, the things that he tells us to do, it's not that he's trying to restrict us in any way. Um, but he realizes, because he's the creator of, of the universe, and this was touched on this morning, that that's the way we were meant to, to, to really function and operate. Sin is an imposition. Uh, you know, if, if sin was the way it was supposed to be, then we would thrive under it, right? But what, what happens? E. Stanley Jones says it's like a splinter that that's we, we find, and it, it's there, and it festers, and, it, and, it, and it, if you don't take care of it, it brings about death. Uh, we, we get sick. Uh, we, we get, uh, it, it drags our, our body down. Sin is an imposition. We're not made to be selfish and accumulate great stores of wealth for ourselves. We're made to trust. We weren't made uh, to harbor hate and bitterness in our life. We disintegrate under that. We weren't made to live our lives full of lust and envy. And Jesus said, come to me and learn of me. And here's the yoke. You can walk right beside me and I'll teach you exactly what you need to know. What kind of teacher is he? Jesus, this is the only time I think that Jesus said how, he, how he's like. And he said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. Gentle. He's not like C.S. Lewis's teachers. Uh, I think in Surprised by Joy or one of his uh, books, he talks about his teachers. They were, they were dictators. They were brutal dictators. Uh, arrogant, cold, superior. And Jesus says, I'm not like that. I'm meek and gentle. You can trust me. He was not a teacher like the Pharisees. And the scribes, who in Matthew 23, verses 2 to 4, it says, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So there are teachers out there who, that's, 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 their, that's their modus operandi. What kind of teacher is Jesus? Gentle humble, the kind of teacher that stooped down and washed his disciples' feet. And like we see in the yoke of oxen, he stands with an open space beside him. And he gives us the invitation, come. Learn of me, and I'll show you the way to freedom. Freedom found in restriction. The athlete knows that. Uh, the athlete knows that he, had, in order to, to win the prize, he has to restrict himself. The result, if we do that, is rest. It's a transformation. It transforms our life. This doesn't mean that things don't matter. I think people maybe read this passage sometime and think, well, Take our burdens to Jesus, and he takes it all, and nothing matters. 
it's not the lightening of the law, it's actually the tightening of the law. And we see that in Matthew chapter 5. You've heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, love your enemies. It's the way to rest. Do you know how many lives are in travail because of the unwillingness to forgive, to love those who have, to refuse to love those who mistreated them? Do you know how many lives are destroyed and in utter chaos because of lust and immorality? Do you know how many lives are consumed with finding security in the things of this life, robbed of peace, robbed of generosity, full of fear and mistrust? How do we find rest from that? How do we find uh, peace from that? Uh, David says in Psalm 119, 44 and 45, So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty or in freedom, for I seek your precepts. You know, this is an amazing thing. Most gifts and talents, you can't transfer. So I, I come up and I see an artist that can, can paint a beautiful picture. And I say, give me that. He, he can't just give me the ability to paint. Uh, I can see a mason who, who takes a bunch of stones. And he, he can see in those stones how to build a beautiful wall. And I say, I, I want that. Give that to me. Well... You, you can't just transfer that. Or a writer who's able to write, and with words, picture just emerge. And, and give me that. I want that. Most gifts are not transferable. But Jesus makes us an incredible offer here this morning. He says, come to me, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, and I'm going to give you this gift. The gift of rest, soul rest, not rest from toil, rest in toil. So it's not, not a matter that uh, we, we, don't have, uh, we don't have things to do, that we're not, uh, I mean, we can look and see the, uh, some of our forefathers who, who suffered greatly, and yet they had that rest, that soul rest that only Jesus can give. My yoke is easy. Not easy peasy, that's not really what that word means. The word means it fits well. It doesn't rub, it doesn't chafe, and my burden is light. Why is our burden light? Because Jesus is there with us in that yoke. Uh, James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Oswald Smith was a missionary to the West Coast Indians, and this was a group of Indians that were plagued by alcoholism and uh, hopelessness and despair. And especially after, uh, there's a couple different uh, accounts of, of how this song came to be, but after a funeral of a, of a child, and he saw the hopelessness, and he, he re realized what could happen when Jesus comes into the picture. And someone challenged him to write a song about that, and so he did. This song was made uh, famous by George Beverly Shea. But I want you to think about what happens. It's, it says, draw near to God. So we accept his invitation, and we draw near to him. We yoke up with him, and then Jesus comes and comes near to us. He comes into the situation. One sat alone beside the highway bagging, his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the darkness. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. So there we have the story of Bartimaeus. From home and friends the evil spirits drove him. Among the tombs he dwelt in misery. He cut himself as demon powers possessed him. Then Jesus came and set the captive free. There's the man in the tomb. Unclean, unclean, the leper cried in torment. The deaf, the dumb, in helplessness stood near. The fever raged, disease had gripped his victim. When Jesus came, then Jesus came and cast out every fear. The leper. Their hearts were sad, as in the tomb they laid him, for death had come and taken him away. Their night was dark and bitter tears were falling. Then Jesus came and night was turned to day. Lazarus. 
So men today have found the Savior able. They could not conquer passion, lust, and sin. Their broken hearts had left them sad and lonely. Then Jesus came and dwelt himself within. And the Course says, when Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. He takes the gloom and fills the life with glory. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. We're left this morning with this incomparable invitation. And that invitation is still open. You know, a lot of times an invitation demands a response, RSVP. Jesus told a parable once of some people who made excuses why they would not accept his invitation. And so I, I guess I just want to let us with the, uh, the question this morning. Um, what is your answer to this great invitation? Is it regrets? Sorry, I cannot come. I will not come. Or will you bow your neck? Slip it into the yoke beside our loving Savior and follow him wherever he leads. So let's take the challenge uh, this morning. Uh, we do have a wonderful Savior, and I, I just want to give him the honor and glory. Any comments?